Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Live the Way series. Today I have the privilege and immense pleasure uh, to welcome my teacher and my mentor and the founder of Vida Vida, uh, Vaidya Matuj Masid. So without further ado, Mateusz, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be here in the middle of this craziness and your busy schedule. Uh, yeah, well, you're such an inspiration with your uh, work with the project Vida Vida and in many ways you're one of the reasons this channel even exists so I'm really excited <laughs> to having you here it's, it's totally, totally my pleasure, pleasure and I've been like bothering, bothering you to do this for two years, years now <laughs> mate. Probably, probably probably around two years, years. That I've, that I've been like, like Ricardo, you have, you have to do it. it. Just, just do it. it. Just, just do it. it. Just, just do it. And now it's born. So it's like, I'm. I feel first. It's such a privilege to be here for the beginning, for the inauguration, for like to see this baby being born. I'm sure this is gonna produce a lot of amazing results. I'm sure it's gonna create a ton of value for people, especially now. It's such a great moment now for you to open this channel to be able to help people. People are in uh, facing some dire straits now. They're like at home, quarantines all over the world. You're in Canada, I'm here in India, in the countryside of India, and we're also quarantined. We just spoke now on the live that I do with a bunch of people from Brazil, from uh, Switzerland, from Australia, Australia everybody's, everybody's quarantined, quarantined right now, right now. So, so people need this now more than ever. And uh, I want to congratulate you and also recognize the strength because it's not easy. A lot of people think that it's an easy job to just put yourself out there, to just go live. And, and I know, I know it's, it's scary, scary, your, your heart, heart races in the beginning, beginning and, and but, but, but it's, it's all worth it in the end when, when you see the amount of people that you can help, the amount, amount of value that, that, you, that you can create for people. So, so it's such a pleasure and an honor, honor to be here right now. Right now. Thank, Thank you for, you for the invitation. The invitation. Uh, so uh, rather than me just uh, reading your bio uh, and before we jump into our topic today, the four pillars of health, what does the title Vaidya mean? And since you're the first Brazilian, to ever hold that title, why don't you just share with us how was that journey and following up to that question, tell us a little bit about your project Vida Vida. Sure, amazing, amazing. I, love I love that. that. Uh, so, so Fidea comes, comes from, from the root, the uh, Sanskrit word vid, vid which, which means knowledge. knowledge. So, so the, the same way that the word Ayurveda, no, the word Veda comes, comes from the same root, root word vid. vid. So, so it, it also, also means knowledge. In the case, case of Ayurveda, it means the knowledge of Ayu, so, so of the life period, period of, of the moment uh, in between your birth and your, and your death. death. Now, now we, we call this Ayu, who, like, like it means the junction of four main things. things. When, when there's, there's a body, when you, when you have sense, sense organs, when you, when you have, you have the, the capacity to join information and to understand information, information. And, and that thing that is you. you. Below, below all this things, things below, below all of this, this there's something, something that you call me. me. Uh, we, we call it Sharira India Sattva Atma Samyoga. So they join uh, uh, some yoga of the body, the, body, the senses, the, the sattva, which is sometimes translated as mind, and the atma, which is you. So this is Ayurveda, Ayuhu Veda, so, so the knowledge of Ayurveda. So, so Veda uh, comes from the same root word vid. And, and it means knowledge. knowledge. So, so Vaidya is that person that is, that is supposed to have some, some knowledge about something in general, but, but in, in this case specifically about Ayurveda. About Ayurveda. So, so the, the title that, that we get after we graduate in medical school in, in India, um, I graduated uh, from, uh, from the BAMS course, course, so the Bachelor in Ayurveda Medicine, Medicine and Surgery at Gujarat Ayurveda University here in, in the city of Jamnagar in the state of Gujarat. Gujarat in, in India. India. I, I have, have the privilege of being the first Brazilian uh, to undergo this adventure. <laughs> and, and it was uh, uh, definitely an adventure. An adventure. I've, been I've been here for, here for this is my seventh, seventh year, year uh, in, in India, India now. now. And, and I, completed I completed the course. course. It was amazing. It was, it was such a great, great opportunity to be in, in India uh, for, for for all this time. time. And more, more than actually being in the university and doing uh, working, working at a hospital, an Ayurvedic hospital, hospital, hospital and, and understanding the intricacies of how Ayurveda is uh, put, put to practice, practice in the world nowadays. nowadays. 
More, more than, than that, that, I got to travel, travel around, around the country and, and to meet amazing, amazing ideas, amazing doctors, amazing doctors and, and to learn under them from, from the, the south, south to the, to the north, north of India. India. Uh, everywhere, everywhere I went, went people, people were always very welcoming, welcoming to me because, because they were always very maybe, maybe surprised, surprised that, that a person, uh, that, a uh, that a foreigner would come and study, study like, like this. this. There, there are a few, a few of us, like, like a few foreigners, foreigners that are always doing EMS, EMS but not so, so many of us, but, but especially none, none like, like never, never a Brazilian before, before me. And uh, Indians, Indians love, love Brazil. Brazil. So whenever, so whenever you, you say, well, all, all over, over the world, world, I lived in China, I lived in Nepal, I lived in, Nepal, I lived in many, many countries, and everywhere, most, most countries, when you say you're Brazilian, Brazilian people put a big smile on their faces, and they, they talk, talk about soccer, they talk about samba, they talk about, they talk about something, uh, about, about the movies, that, that like, like the, the Rio, Rio movie, or they, they chant some songs. So it's always amazing to see that people, even though we're like very far from Brazil, they are very, they recognize. Brazil, Brazil and, and they, they are very respectful, respectful also of our culture, culture. so, so that's, that's been quite amazing. amazing. And, and they, they also opened the doors, doors very wide, wide because, because, because like, like you came, came all the way from Brazil, Brazil to study, study our, our culture, culture. So, so they are very honored also to have foreigners, foreigners studying here. here. And then, and then in the, the third, third year of medical school, school I was invited to go to Brazil by a dear friend of mine called Laura Pires. Uh, she's, she's a, a very uh, uh, well-known well figure, figure in the world of Ayurveda in Brazil, Brazil specifically, but in Portuguese, Portuguese language in general. general. So, so she invited me, we've been, we've been good, good friends for many, many years, years and, and she invited me to go to Brazil, Brazil and, and to, to give, give a lecture. lecture. And, I and I told her, her oh, you're, you're crazy, crazy. Like, like I'm in third year medical school, there's nothing I can contribute. And she said, Matthew. No, no one ever, ever did this thing before. So, so there's, there's a bunch of people that study Ayurveda, Ayurveda that, that read the book, that, that undergo some, some basic, basic training, training or, or therapist training, training courses, courses, but, but no, no one ever did the BMS in, in Brazil. Brazil. So, so even though, though you're, you're still, still uh, in, in the middle, middle of the process, process you're, you're like, like years, years ahead, ahead of most people, people that we know. know. So, so it would be of great, great value, value for people if you came. And, and Laura, Laura has, has a way, way with me. Like, like she's, she's one, of one of my best friends, friends ever, ever, and she, she can convince me of almost, almost anything. So, so she, she convinced, convinced me basically, basically of going, going from, from India, India to Brazil, Brazil to spend a vacation, vacation there, there, and to, to give a lecture. lecture. So, so that's, that's what, what I did. We did, we did a lecture together. together. I filmed, I filmed it, using it using my iPad, and uh, my little sister back then. I call her little sister, but she's almost 30 years old, but I still call her little sister. But she's been... Annoying, annoying me for, for two years, years uh, to, that to that point. She was, she was always saying, saying like, you have to um, have, have a YouTube, YouTube channel, you should, you should do, do an Instagram thing. thing. And, and I was, was always very adverse to social media. media. Like, like I'm, I'm, I never, never enjoyed... enjoyed uh, uh, I, first, first of all, of all I, I don't like cameras. cameras. Like, like, I didn't, I didn't like, like cameras, cameras at all. Second of all, I didn't do a lot of technology, right? Just like you. I didn't enjoy technology like like that that much. I didn't own like smartphones and then laptops and stuff like that. To that, to that moment, moment, in that moment, moment in time. time. Um, so, so she, she told, told me you should, should have an Instagram, you should do a YouTube channel, da, 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 da. and I was like, there's no way I'm doing, doing this. this. Like, but then, but then after, after two years of her saying, saying this thing, thing, I thought, okay, 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 okay maybe, maybe I'll start, start something. something. And, then, and then I started with a series that, that was designed for myself, actually. I thought, if Matthew couldn't come to India to study Ayurveda, what, what would, would be an amazing, amazing tool for, for that, that guy? guy? Like, like if, if he didn't, didn't have the resources or he, or he couldn't, couldn't because, because of his family, family or job or something, or something if, if he couldn't do this crazy thing of just, of just quitting, quitting everything and moving, moving to, to India, India for six, six years, years or seven, seven years, years uh, what, what would be the most amazing, amazing tool that he, that he could, could have at his, his disposal? So, so I started, started a series that, that I called Vida Vida, Vida, Vida into, into the Samhita or something like that. that. Every, Every Wednesday, Wednesday, I would film, film myself, myself with, with my iPad. iPad. I only had an iPad, iPad back then. then. That, that was the, the entire uh, technological uh, knowledge, knowledge that, that I had. It was, was like my iPad, and, and then I filmed film myself with my iPad, iPad reading this book, this 1,500-year-old book called Ashtanga Dayam. And, and I would, I would just, just read this book, book translate, translate it, and, and comment, comment on it, it 
based, based on, on the way, way exact, exact the same, the exact same, exact same way that I've been learning, learning with my teachers, teachers and my gurus here in India. India. So, so I, I participated, participated in a few groups, groups, groups with, with a few teachers that, that follow tra traditions, traditions that are like, like hundreds and hundreds of years, years old. old. Uh, 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 we, have we have a method, method of how, how to study this thing, thing of how, how to understand it. it. So, so there's, there's nothing, nothing, there was, there was nothing, nothing like this available, available in Portuguese, Portuguese at that, that moment. moment. And, I and I thought, thought I, should I should make this available in Portuguese. Then, then I filmed myself, myself, I put, I put it, it on YouTube, and, and like no, no one, one watched it. <laughs> and, and, and I knew no one would watch, watch it. And, and I, because, because I was filming it and producing it for myself, for the, the, the geeky Matthew that, that could come, come to India. So I knew, I'm just going to make this thing and put it out there. And, and then, then when Lala invited, invited me to go to Brazil to speak, speak I, thought, I thought, I'm just, just going to record the lecture. lecture. So, so I recorded, recorded it also on my iPad. iPad. I would, I would, everywhere, everywhere I would go, go, I would bring, bring my iPad, iPad, record it on my iPad, iPad edit the, the thing on iMovie, which, which was the software that was available on the iPad, iPad and, and I would upload it to YouTube. YouTube. That, that was, was the whole project back then. then. And in the beginning, maybe I had like one view. It was my mom, and she was like super proud. And then I had like three views, which was like my mom, my dad, and a friend, or some people were just like, what the hell are you doing with this books and stuff like that? But then it started to grow. And now, uh, this series alone, Vida Vida no Sanjitas, uh, we have around like 300, 500 views each video, which is nothing for YouTube numbers, but it's insane to think that like 500 people are interested in learning Ayurveda according to this ancient books. Then I started putting the lectures also online. And because of the lecture, I spoke on this. This lecture was the first lecture I've ever gave, like talking about Ayurveda. And in this lecture, people, I, I was facing a dilemma. Like every time we learn Ayurveda in my tradition here in India, you have to know Sanskrit and you have to get the books. Like you have to take Charaka Samhita, Shankaridayam. You, you need the books. So how can I explain Ayurveda to these people in a very simple way that they can use? Like I'm a very practical person. And I was concerned that they would take whatever I gave them and put it into practice. I was not interested in telling these people about their dosha. Like everyone wanted to know their dosha. And I'm like, what are you going to do with this information? Like, I'm going to tell you that you're like vata. What do you do? Like you start following some vata table about things that you should eat. Then it becomes like a religion. It becomes like a dogma. And I didn't want that. I wanted people to use Ayurveda for what Ayurveda is for, which is an like ultimately a tool for self-knowledge. It's not a tool for you to become something that people expect you to be. It's not some uh, dogma that people tell you that you are Vata Pita and then you start following a bunch of rules from outside in. It's a tool for you to realize what the hell you are. And it doesn't matter if it's whatever Sanskrit word or whatever dosha. It's whatever you are and to live aligned with that. So I have uh, this tendency to try to find ways to make things practical to people. And I tried to do that in that lecture. So I explained to people in that in that lecture almost three years ago now. Wow. Um, I explained to them uh, in practice, if you want to apply Ayurveda in your daily life, you should just concern yourself with four things that I call the four pillars. I called as a game, almost as a play, uh, I call the four pillars of health. So I told them, just focus on the four pillars of health. And in truth, I told them also, uh, actually in the Vedic knowledge, in Ayurvedic knowledge specifically, we have three pillars of health. We called it the Traya Upastamba. So the three Traya Upastamba, the pillars, so we call them Ahara, Nidra, and Brahmacharya. Ahara means literally food. So whatever you eat is a, an essential part of your well-being, your health, uh, your ability to perform, your ability to have an amazing life, to wake up in the morning feeling great, and to go to sleep at night also feeling great. So Ahara means food. Nidra means sleep. So the amount of sleep that you get, like how many hours do you get, how, what time do you wake up, and what do you do before you go to sleep, like a night hygiene, like a sleep hygiene so you can have the best night of your life. 
That's sleep. That's fine also. And then brahmacharya. And brahmacharya is a problem. Brahmacharya is a problem for, for many reasons. And the main reason is like any book with any translation, almost any translation that you get, will translate brahmacharya as celibacy. And I don't know how is uh, Canada working, but in Brazil, when you say celibate, the whole place is empty already. Like no one wants to know. Like if you say the three pillars of health is like food, people are like, yes, food, food is fine. Sleep, yes, sleep. Okay, I can sleep. And celibate in the whole place is empty because people are like, I'm sorry, you lost me, Matthew. There's nothing I can do. Um, I will not be some monk in the top of the Himalayas or something. And I got that and I felt that. And actually, brahmacharya does not mean celibacy. Brahmacharya can mean celibacy in certain ways to understand it in a religious context. So because most people here uh, in India are Hindus and most people that study Ayurveda, they're either Hindu or more specifically Hare Krishna or something. They tr celibacy has a like a huge role to play in their culture, in the way they see life, in the way they behave. Um, but it's not necessarily celibacy. And according to Ayurveda, is not celibacy. If you read the classics, the classics of Ayurveda, they talk about sex a lot. So it would be crazy for them to say that one of the one of the pillars of health is celibacy, and then they spend many chapters talking about how to how, like what is the proper time of the year to have sex, how many day, how many times in the week you should have sex in that time, and all these problems that come from you not having sex or you having too much sex. They talk about sex a lot. So why would they tell you to be a celibate and then tell you to have a bunch of sex? Like, are they crazy? Are they trying to hurt us or play with our heads? So uh, in chapter two of Ashtanga Rudayam Sutrasthana, which is this book 1,500 um, years ago, written by Vagbhata, he talks in the second chapter, second chapter. This book has 120 chapters and on chapter two, he talks about brahmacharya. He just calls it from a different name. He calls it sadvarta. He calls it the rules to have like a healthy life. And that is brahmacharya. Brahmacharya literally means to live in accordance with the universe, to live in accordance to nature. So it, regardless if you're Hindu or Christian or Buddhist or Muslim or it doesn't or uh, like, I don't know, atheist, it doesn't matter. Like to live according to the rules of the universe is to do brahmacharya. And I realized that that was very hard to explain and very hard to put in practice because it uh, brings on the question of religion. And then we have to talk about rules and then people start getting crazy. But my religion talks about these rules and your religion talks about those rules. So I decided I won't talk about brahmacharya. I would break brahmacharya into two very practical pillars of health. The number one is movement. You have a body. If you're alive, you have to move. You don't have a choice. And silence. Silence is, it can be meditation, but also is the way I understand uh, whatever you are, like truly, honestly, below all these layers that we get and that society puts on top of us and our mother and our father and like Ricardo Barreto is a Portuguese male, blah, 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 blah. And like below all these layers, underneath all of this, there is something that is true. That whenever I, uh, whenever you say I, you're referring to that thing. So silence is the pillar of health when I talk about this thing that in Ayurveda we call Atma. And that is usually translated as soul, which is a very poor translation of the word atma, in my understanding. Uh, atma means that which you are, which doesn't matter. You can give it the name you want, but whenever you say me, that's what, you, that's what you're talking about. Whenever you say mine, that's not what you're talking about. So if you say my phone, it's not you, it's yours. If you say my laptop, that's yours, it's not you. If you say my body, that's yours, it's not you. If you say my mind, that's also yours, it's not you. If you say my soul, that's also yours. So it's also by definition not you. There is something that owns all these things. And this thing that owns all the things 
this is what I call silence. This is what my gurus call silence. Dr. Srinivas Hejmadi Acharya, for instance, one of my teachers, uh, he calls this silence, says this is the ultimate uh, reality. This is what you are uh, be like underneath everything else. So I realized these four things, and this is the lecture that I gave. My first lecture was like, somebody asked, like, what should I do? Uh, I just want to be healthy. I'm a mother of three. Uh, I work eight hours a day. Don't talk to me about doshas and all this, uh, this Sanskrit words. Just tell me what to do. And I told her, okay, just focus on four things. Just focus on what you eat. Is whatever you're putting on your mouth and swallowing, is this good for your health? Yes or no? Uh, you have to eat. Eating is not an option. Because you don't have an option, you will have to eat. And in the moment that you eat, you can choose if you're eating something healthy or unhealthy. There's nothing in between. Either what you're eating is promoting health or it's destroying your health. Because whatever you put in your mouth, even if it's something neutral, it's taking the place of something else that could be healthy. So if you're eating like some horrible margarine that you decided to put in your bread, you're not putting olive oil on your bread, for instance. So olive oil is better than whatever processed, super whatever horrible food that you're spreading on your bread. You always have a choice, and if you use one thing, you, stop, you, you decide not to use the other. The moment you spread uh, some horrible thing on your bread, you could have put hummus on your bread instead, which is full of nutrients and minerals and vitamins and all the goodies. So you don't have an option to eat or not to eat. You just have to choose how to eat. You don't have an option to sleep or not to sleep. You're just going to choose how good your sleep is. You don't have an option to move or not to move. We're always moving. Whenever you're sitting, just by sitting and breathing, you're moving. Even if you try to be still, even if you decide I'm not going to move for an hour and I'm just going to be completely as, as quiet as I can, you will realize if you do that how much movement is actually happening in the body all the time that you barely realize because you move so much. So we are like if you own a body, you are moving. And if you're moving, you can decide if you're moving with quality or poorly. If you move poorly, you will have a poor body. You will be a 35-year-old male with a herniated, like a bunch of herniated discs, and you cannot move properly, and your uh, knee hurts, and your neck, something else, and uh, like a bunch of problems. Because you're not treating your body correctly, you're not treating, not, not feeding your body with uh, intelligent movement. So if you feed your body poorly, your body will perform poorly. And you don't have an option to be quiet or not. Silence is the nature of human beings. So if you know how to be silent or not, if you have a good quality uh, pillar of silence or not, that you can choose. But you cannot choose whether you're going to be silent or not. So that, that's why I started calling them the four pillars of, the pillars of health. I explained this in the lecture. I filmed it. I put it on YouTube. And I thought it was over. I thought I spoke everything I needed to speak. I was like, I'm never going to need to do another lecture ever in my life because I said everything that I, that I know in a couple of hours. So there's nothing else. And then after the lecture, people came and said, I love the four pillars of health thing that you spoke about. Can you give a lecture just about the four pillars? And I told them, no, like, that's all. Like, just eat healthy, sleep enough, move your body and shut up a little bit. That's not much more than you, like, what else can I say about this? No, Matthew, you have to, like, this is amazing. Like, I, I, I want to know more about this. You have to speak more about this. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, I didn't, like, there's nothing else to speak. But then people started inviting me to another lecture. And every time they invite me to speak, uh, usually the producers, they give me uh, a challenge, I like to, to call it. Like, I don't choose what I'm going to talk about. Wh whoever invites me, they choose. So they say, can you come and speak about, like, just now in Portugal, they invited me to speak, and, uh, and they, uh, the organizer of the lecture, she wanted me to speak about smart cities and smart technology and Ayurveda. So she invited a guy from the UN 
which specializes in smart cities and smart technology. So she wanted me to speak to with him about like old knowledge and old technology, Ayurveda, and smart technology, smart cities, and all of that. And that was a trip. Like I never thought about this. I never read anything. I'm not a specialist on smart cities and smart technology. And we, I had the privilege to go to uh, one of the like one of the main universities in North Portugal, the Universidade do Minho, and speak about this with a like a like a like a specialist. And it was an amazing lecture. It was like a lot of fun. So I love being challenged by people, and then I keep going around the world and speaking. And uh, the more people started asking me about the four pillars of health, the more I decided I have to do more research then. And then I started doing some research. According to the Samhitas, like, what do they say about the four pillars of health, actually? Like, what does Charaka Samhita says, a book that is 3,000 to 4,000 years old? What Sushruta Samhita says, which is a 2,000-year-old book that specializes in surgery? What does Ashtangarudayam say, this 1,500-year-old uh, book? And I started compiling information on the four pillars of health. And this information became a workshop, which I call 4P1, the four pillars in one weekend. And I started teaching this workshop. I taught maybe 10 of these workshops in Portugal and in Brazil, all over Brazil from south to north, and in Portugal also from south to north. And I thought that was it. Like, I taught everything I could, but actually in the process of researching, uh, I got more than a weekend's worth of uh, knowledge. And I realized, actually, I can teach like one weekend, just one pillar in one weekend. So I needed actually four pillars, four weekends to teach the four pillars. So I designed a workshop called the 4P4, four pillars in four weekends. I never taught this workshop. It didn't happen because this became another thing. But I, by researching more and more, I actually got enough no, uh, information to teach a full week, a full week to each pillar, which I called the 4PX, the experience in the four pillars. So we would do like a retreat. And in this retreat, we will be just going deeper into each pillar, just one week of silence, one week of uh, eating, one week of uh, sleep, da 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 and I researched so much about these pillars that I'm like, the more I researched, the more things opened up, like more information of modern science, for instance, like Matthew Walker, which is a PhD that specializes in sleep. I started going through his work and, and knowing like, oh, how, how many interesting things are available now in modern medicine and modern science that are completely relatable to the knowledge that Ayurveda proposed uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, I started being um, an intern, like a volunteer at nutritionfacts.org, which is an initiative that studies health and nutrition, like lifestyle medicine and nutrition with Dr. Michael Greger as a head. I went to PCRM, like the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in, in Washington, D.C., uh, to research, to, to know a little bit more about what is the top like what, what the top researchers in nutrition and the world are, talk, are talking about. And I would understand that the best available knowledge regarding nutrition in the world today has a lot to do with the traditional Ayurvedic knowledge about sleep, the same thing, about nutrition, the same thing, about movement, the same thing. I'm studying movement under Ido Portal, which is an Israeli teacher. This guy studies a lot about movement. I am proudly one of his students. Uh, and I'm like, oh my God, these people are talking about very similar things that Ayurveda was talking about. So from this, Vida Veda developed. So Vida Veda is this initiative to just make this knowledge available to everyone. And I try to make as much knowledge as possible available. I, I like to say that we offer this knowledge uh, freely uh, online and for free to everyone. And we offer a few courses that are paid so we can maintain the staff, but like 80 to 90% of everything we make, we put it uh, online for free. Uh, up to now, up to April 2020, uh, most of this knowledge is available in Portuguese language only. I gave a few lectures in Spanish and I did a few things in English also. But now in 2020, we are going to start uh, making more content in English 
so we can benefit people that don't speak Portuguese. In the beginning, I focused on Portuguese because, to be honest, there's so much knowledge available in English already. And it would be easy for me to make English content, but I felt it wasn't fair. Like, there is already a lot of knowledge in English, and there's nothing almost available in Portuguese. So I thought my countrymen... Because I'm Brazilian and Portuguese, both. I have double nationality. So I have a lot of love towards Portugal and towards Brazil specifically. And I thought, I cannot leave these people hanging. Like, there's so much knowledge available in English, but there's nothing in Portuguese. Like, all the main books of Ayurveda, no Portuguese, no good Portuguese translation yet. Uh, no good videos available. So no, like, knowledge of Ayurveda as it was taught classically here in India, because I'm the first BMS uh, person. Like, So Vida Veda was my life's mission to make this knowledge available in Portuguese, in English, in Spanish, in any language that we can uh, make this knowledge available uh, through courses, online classes, online seminars, physical stuff also. So I traveled the world offering courses. Uh, before Corona uh, happened, I was scheduled to be in Brazil and in Portugal. Now all my travel uh, travel plans were canceled due to coronavirus. But in August, I'm supposed to be in Japan and Korea. So just to give you a few examples of like I travel the world. Uh, I'm like a nomadic doctor, uh, sort of speak. And I just uh, my life is devoted to traveling the world and trying to help people as much as I can with this knowledge. So this was like a half an hour answer to your question. I hope this is uh, helpful to people. That's uh, wonderful. So and it's amazing the amount of uh, content you produce. Like you come live every day. There's always something going on almost every day. So it's amazing. Uh, I'm sure it takes a lot of work. Now, just going back to something you said, you said that it's always about, it's like you have a choice without having a choice because you, you always have to do something. You don't have a choice. But it's about to make that choice a conscious decision about what's going to support you, be better for you rather than not. But at the same time, it seems, since you said that whatever you find now, it was written in the Samhitas, that is not a new problem that we're facing uh, it seems like we don't know how to live a healthy life. It's not something that is happening now. It's been happening for uh, thousands of years. So how do you see this knowledge of Ayurveda being a, a support or being the leading way about a healthy life in today's society? You know, a lot of people paying a lot of attention to modern uh, knowledge and modern science. And sometimes Ayurveda is seen as a valuable knowledge, but the old kind of knowledge, like why would you be paying attention to something that was written 4,000 years ago? So how do you see the place of Ayurveda to, in today's world? And let's say going forward a few decades, uh, how do you see the place of Ayurveda dealing with health in our life? Thank you. That's a, like a great question. And... I see the role of Ayurveda in our lives, not for 10 years, but for thousands of years, the same way it's been occupying already our lives since thousands of years. Because Ayurveda is nothing more than humans observing reality and trying to understand it. So there's no difference between good Ayurveda and good modern medicine. There is no difference between good Ayurveda and good Chinese traditional medicine. We're always, we're, all of us, we're all trying to understand the same system. We are looking at the human body and the human life and trying to make sense of it. That's what Ayurveda has been doing for thousands and thousands of years. That's what modern medicine has been doing before with Hippocrates, but since maybe 150, 200 years in this new way that we call modern medicine. Modern medicine was basically born with uh, Semmelweis, Pasteur, these guys that in the middle of the 19th century started experimenting with reality in new ways and came up with a few um, new concepts of like microbes and of uh, how to not get pregnant women sick, like uh, Semmelweis's 
uh, main like job with his uh, study of uh, Kinderbett fever was to understand that if doctors wash their hands in between patients, they tend not to the patients tend not to die so much. So it's crazy. Like the idea of prophylactics just came to modern medicine in the in the middle of the 19th century. While if you read Sushruta Samhita, a 2,000 year old book. So Shruta was talking about the same concepts, but 2,000 years ago. So anyone that actually appreciates science, as I do, like I don't love Ayurveda. I love medicine. It doesn't matter which shape or form it takes. I'm the first person to go to whatever uh, congress on exponential medicine online. I'm watching to know what is the last, the latest developments on the microbiome and what are they doing with CRISPR technology? I'm there in the first row because I'm, I'm passionate about medicine. I'm not passionate about the Egyptian medicine. I'm passionate about all types of medicine because medicine is people, men and women trying to understand the human body, how it works, and whenever it's sick or whenever it's not working properly, how to make it work properly. So I think the knowledge of Ayurveda just had a 5,000 year head start on modern medicine, so to speak. So there is a lot of knowledge that is peer reviewed that was uh, uh, transcribed in like books that we call the Samhitas. And uh, is the, these books are just uh, scientists observing reality and taking note. After 100 years, a new generation of scientists will come and they will comment on these books and take note. Then 200 years later and 5,000 years later, a group of scientists will come. They will look at these books and they will take note. So we have really good peer-reviewed li literature, uh, which is a very similar concept uh, to evidence-based medicine. The concept proposed by David Addy and Sackett in the 80s uh, is the concept that we've been doing with Ayurveda since thousands and thousands of years. So why not? My question is not why Ayurveda? Why look for, to Ayurveda for answers? My question is why not? Like if you are, if you have a scientific mentality, and I think this is, uh, this is a very hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. The idea that a scientific mentality, a scientific mind is, in essence, open. That is the difference, the difference between a scientific mind and a dogmatic mind. So if you have a scientific mind, you always ask why not. You always think about it and you try to see if it's true or not. You put it to the test. You test it and you peer review it and you double blind it, and you do whatever you need to do to verify if there is anything valuable in that piece of knowledge or not. And if not, let's toss it and let's move on. But maybe there is. And the main thing that I'm like amazed by uh, is when I see modern doctors that call themselves scientists, but they don't believe in Ayurveda or they don't believe in something. It's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of testing and trying to understand how much of it is scientific knowledge, how much of it is usable, and how much of it it was a product of the past that should stay in the past. Because knowledge, the Ayurvedic knowledge is alive and it's always recycling itself. If you think about Ayurveda as the science of life, Modern medicine is just Ayurveda developing, actually. It's almost like uh, Ayurveda is alive and well with modern doctors. Like, I love to say that good Ayurveda and good modern medicine are very similar, actually, when you observe it in, in hospital, in the practice. And bad modern medicine and bad Ayurveda are very similar also. So that is another thing that I see a lot, is people thinking that, no, Matthew, I hate modern medicine. They just prescribe a bunch of pills. They don't know what they're doing. They're just trying to rip us off. That's why I believe in Ayurveda, because Ayurveda has no side effects. Ayurveda is free of any problems. Ayurveda was brought to us by the gods themselves. So it becomes almost like a matter of belief and religion, which is the opposite 
of what Ayurveda is intended to offer to people. Ayurveda is supposed to be like uh, like a chest full of knowledge from thousands of years of observation and experimentation. That's it. We are free if we know how to, and it's tough because you have to t- learn Sanskrit. Uh, traditionally, Indian culture is not very open to foreigners trying to come and take their stuff. They have very good reasons for not being open to it because last time they were, like the British Empire just took over the country for two centuries. So they are very closed and they're not very easy, not very accessible uh, when when it comes to like the depth of knowledge and true, true knowledge. So maybe you have to come here and stay here for six years and learn Sanskrit and learn Gujarati and learn Hindi and be able to live with these people or like I have good news. Maybe you don't have to because there's other crazy people doing that and offering this knowledge uh, free to everyone online. Like you do, you're doing now with a way of Ayurveda and like other people are doing uh, freely now. And in this quarantine, what better way to learn uh, about Ayurveda and to learn how to be healthier than to like access like for instance way of ayurveda so i think ayurveda is not something from the past i think it's alive and well and i think it's going to be even stronger going into the future because it's just a like an ocean of knowledge that everyone can benefit from more so modern medicine and modern uh science because if they are indeed scientific on the way they look at things they will not discard they will not throw the baby out with the water they will understand that some things of ayurveda are not current they're not going to be usable now because they represented a culture a civilization a reality of 2000 years ago so we talk about some plants that don't exist anymore we talk about using plants in a way that was possible a thousand years ago, but now it's not anymore because we're like nine billion people occupying the planet. So, but if you understand the principles behind this knowledge, you can easily apply it practically to the days that we are living now uh, to help human beings. Maybe not with everything. Ayurveda is not amazing at uh, road accidents. Like if I suffer an accident in the middle of the road, I'm not going to claim for a Vaidya. Somebody please find me an Ayurvedic doctor. We are horrible at emergency care. Uh, we are not very good at uh, like end of life care, for instance. We are not the best at very critical, acute diseases such as, for instance, coronavirus. We are not the people that are rushing to the front of the hospitals to take care of everyone with Ayurveda when you have a problem that can uh, severely impair your respiratory system in a very short time. Modern medicine is amazing at acute care. Ayurveda is amazing at chronic care. And the most deadly diseases nowadays, number one and number two in the US, in Brazil, in Portugal, probably in Canada, in the UK, in Japan, in India, are cardiovascular disease and cancer. Some places like the UK, cancer is number one in Japan. Some places like Brazil and the US, cardiovascular disease is number one and cancer is number two. These diseases are lifestyle diseases. They are not acute. They take, like Alzheimer's is another example, they take decades to develop. And that's why we call them chronic. Chronic comes from chronus, which is time. So you need a lot of time to develop those diseases. Ayurveda is, has on its side chronos, time. So we are pretty, pretty good at treating chronic diseases. Modern medicine is not that good. Some doctors are amazing at it. Michael Greger, Dean Ornish uh, are a few examples. Michael Clapper is a good example of modern doctors that are amazing at caring uh, for chronic diseases. In general, the idea that you have a patient with high cholesterol, so you just give him a statin, and then after some time, the statin doesn't cure the problem. He didn't have a statin deficiency in the first place, so the statin is not going to cure it. Uh, You just like wait, some other problem will come, he'll have hypertension, and then obesity and diabetes, and then we're not treating the root cause of the problem. 
So people just get sicker and sicker. And then we have societies like we do nowadays. The diseases that kill the most people are chronic diseases, are lifestyle diseases. This is insane. We are dying. Most people that you know, most people that you know and most people that you will meet, they will probably die of lifestyle diseases. Uh, among them, the number one and number two are cardiovascular diseases and cancer. And this is important. Coronavirus, COVID-19, is probably not going to be the number one cause of death of most humans on the planet. This is not me saying that COVID-19 is not important. It is very important because it's an acute problem. We have to deal with it right now social distancing, washing your hands, doing everything that we're doing right now. I'm in quarantine right now, as you are, because we have to take action and in, in swift action in order to contain the spread of this virus. But this virus, COVID-19, uh, the disease COVID-19 is not going to be the number one cause of death, probably is not going to be the number one cause of death of everyone you know. Most people you know right now, and if you take it from memory, your grandparents, your friends, they died probably because of cancer or because of cardiovascular disease. Those diseases are not only preventable, they are curable and they are lifestyle diseases in most cases. I'm not saying that every type of cancer in any stage can be cured. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you led a healthier lifestyle, probably you wouldn't uh, develop the cancer in the first place. So it's not Charaka Samhita. You don't have to go back thousands of years. You can read the latest report by the, AR, uh, the IARC, uh, from the um, World Health Organization, 50 years of research of cancer report. They talk about carcinogen, carcinogenic substances that are actually killing people. Among them is a bunch of things that people, just everyone that you know and that I know, they just eat. So we're putting cancer on our mouths and then we're surprised when cancer shows up somewhere in our bodies. So we're dying from diseases that Ayurveda has a very good understanding of and can contribute a lot uh, to. So that's why I think Ayurveda is going to do really well. It's growing a lot. The, the willing of people to learn more, more about Ayurveda is just, Vita Veda is just growing. Like way of Ayurveda is also bound to grow because people need this knowledge now more than ever. That's wonderful. So uh, going back to the following what you were saying and kind of going back to the four pillars of health, um, what would be a practical advice if you had to give one practical advice for each of the pillar so that people who are here live or will watch the video can start applying right away on their life? Something simple. What would be your suggestion for each of the pillars? That's amazing. I love that because... Uh, I want nothing most than people leaving this live with uh, tools that they can apply in their lives like straight away, like right now. So let's do it. Uh, from the four pillars of health, starting with uh, nutrition. The number one thing that I would talk about in nutrition is the fact that most people that I see in the clinic, they suffer from what we call in Ayurveda, Santarpana Vyadhis. Vyadhi is the word in Sanskrit for disease, and santarpana means excess nutrition. So most people nowadays, they are suffering for, uh, from too much. It's excess. We are a society of excess. You see how people freak out and go to the supermarket and buy months worth of food when they probably already had months worth of food in their homes if they just stopped to realize how much they eat. So the quantity that we're eating now is absolutely outrageous. We do not need to do six, have two, six meals a day. Uh, so I would advise people, if they had to put one thing in practice, is to try to cut, avoid as much as possible any processed or ultra-processed foods. Number one, if whatever you eat come in a packet, with a bunch of ingredients, ingredients that you don't know how to read, you cannot even pronounce them, and you don't know what they are, don't.
Internet is on overuse these days. I'm just trying to reconnect. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave a message after the beep. So it seems like Vidium, the internet in India, had a little crash. I'm just going to wait a few more minutes to see if it's possible to reconnect. Estamos de volta, só um bocadinho, só aqui um momento para tentar conectar. Já estamos aqui ao vivo outra vez. Okay, I think we're back. I think, I think we're, we're back. back also. Yeah. Well, I, I can hear you properly. I think it was my internet was a glitch here. Everyone is uh, wearing out the the internet capacity, even in India. So, so, so where did we stop? Um, okay, so the practical advice regarding sleep. Is it working? Okay, good. So my practical advice regarding sleep is, uh, well, I won't give one. I'll give one practical and one homework. One practical advice regarding sleep is leave your damn phone out of the bedroom. Like if you are going to sleep and you want to have a good night of sleep, and you should, because sleep is probably, I've been doing this for a few years now, it's probably the pillar of health that is more undervalued of all of them. Most people, when I talk about nutrition and when I talk about exercise and when I talk about silence and meditation, they accept it without uh, a lot of resistance. But sleep, most people are having a lot of trouble with sleep nowadays. So the first one is leave your damn phone out of the equation. Like if you want to sleep at 10 p.m., stop messing with electronics at like 9 or something. Give yourself like an hour without electronic equipment, uh, so you can probably uh, make your sleep deeper and more sound. Most, most people nowadays, they're going to bed with their phones. They're like sleeping on top of their phone. They're drooling on their phones. They won't stop using this thing. So keep your phone away from your bed, as much, like as further away from your bed as possible. Um, don't go to bed like playing with your phone. And if you're not like uh, that convinced about Ayurveda, just read a book that is called Why We Sleep from Matthew Walker. So Matthew Walker, PhD, not a PhD on Ayurveda. This guy has been studying sleep for like 20 years, wrote this amazing book called Why We Sleep. Very easy to read for everyone. Uh, you will be amazed at it. So that's my advice on sleep. Uh, movement. 
my advice on the pillar of movement, like very practical advice is just move your body like every single day. No, I'm every day, like Monday to Friday. No, every single damn day, every day, Saturday and Sunday are also uh, days. You have to move your body every single day. What should I do every single day? Whatever you think is fun. So you should move your body every day and you should do something fun with your body every day. If you absolutely hate going to the gym, stop going to the gym. If you don't like your personal trainer, don't have a personal trainer. What do you like to do with your body? Ah, uh, Matthew, I don't like to do anything with my body. No, that's impossible. That's like a, a child saying they don't like vegetables. Vegetables is not like one thing. Vegetables are a bunch of different things. If you tell me you don't like vegetables, it means you haven't tried vegetables enough, you're not open-minded enough. Vegetables include from broccoli to like sweet potatoes. There's nothing in common between those two things. So you cannot say you don't like vegetables. You can say you don't like broccoli. So maybe you don't like going to the gym, but don't you like dancing, maybe salsa? No, Matthew, I hate dancing. Impossible. Maybe you don't like dancing salsa, but have you tried forho? Have you tried tango? Have you tried every single piece of possibility in the uh, available to you in your city? I have. Okay, fine. So you don't like dancing. Maybe you like martial arts. No, Matthew, I hate martial arts. Have you tried all of them? Because there's nothing in common between karate and jujitsu. Have you tried capoeira? Have you tried everything you can? Yes, I have. Okay, let's talk about now aerobic exercise. No, Matthew, I hate all aerobic exercise. You, you hate running, walking, biking, swimming. You hate everything that is possible to do with a human body. I don't believe you. Like, I will believe you when you tell me that you tried enough. So if you're one of the few people that will uh, proudly say they hate all types of exercises, I will challenge you to do one new exercise practice a week, a week. Every week you go do a trial class somewhere. You can do this online even. Just try 10, I don't like yoga, nonsense. Yoga is not one thing. You can do Ashtanga yoga, Vinyasa, Hatha, there's so many hot, there's so many crazy types of yogas right now that it's impossible for you to say I don't like yoga because yoga is not one thing. If you like, if you dislike all types of yoga, fine, don't do yoga, don't do yoga. But if you dislike all types of exercise in general, it's probably because you haven't tried enough things. So try everything, find out what you like and do whatever you like and do it every single day. You have to move every day. In the pillar of silence, uh, the recommendation I would have is to meditate. It's the easiest way to start understanding what I call this pillar of silence. So try some type of guided meditation. So you can use many apps now. You can use Headspace, Insight Timer. You can do 21 days challenge meditation. If you put 21 days meditation challenge, you will find probably 50 free challenges that you can try. You can try visualization, you can try mantra, japa mala, you can try vipassana, you can try anything, but try it and do it even five minutes a day. Matthew, I hate mantras. Fine, don't do mantras. I hate like staring at the wall. Fine, don't do zazen. Just do whatever you, you, you want. I don't care. Do it all. Do all of them. Do all of them once. And maybe in the end, you will find one type of practice that you might enjoy and stick to it. So, and do it every single day. You need to stop for at least five minutes a day. Five minutes. That's like the time that you will take inside an elevator, maybe, to go from your floor down and then up again and then down again and up again. Imagine you go to work. On the way down, you just take, like a, take a little bit of rest. Just pay attention to your breath. It doesn't matter. Whenever you're in the car and the traffic light is, is, is red, instead of reaching for your phone because you're scared of the void and the emptiness of silence, just like, just chill. Just take a deep breath. Just like, it's going to take 30 seconds for the damn like uh, traffic light to turn green. So enjoy those 30 seconds and focus on your breath. 
just turn off the radio, turn off the podcast or whatever, and just focus on your breath for like a second. So that's my advice if I have to tell people to do one thing uh, on the pillar of silence. And actually now we did all of the four. I hope this is useful for everyone because my time is also up. So I'm sure it's very useful. Thank you so much. Just before one minute before uh, we say goodbye, you deal with uh, clinical practice in India with your project uh, Vida Veda. You deal with thousands of people. If you had, what's the biggest problem that you see with people today, very shortly? And yeah. what's your suggestion for it, if like in one paragraph? Yeah. yeah. So the biggest problem with people nowadays that I see in my daily practice is a uh, lack of presence. So I always tell my students and my, uh, my patients, if I have to teach one thing and one thing only, it wouldn't be the doshas. I couldn't care less about panchakarma or any Ayurvedic medicine or Tulsi or any of that stuff. Uh, if I had to teach one thing, I would teach presence. Presence means, do you understand who the hell you are? Do you understand if what you are doing in your daily life, you are doing it because you chose to do it, or, or you're doing it because your parents taught you to do it. You're doing it because there are some social expectations of you to do it. So are you living life on your terms? Are you eating things that are good for you, or you're eating things because you're supposed to, because of your culture, your family, your friends, your husband, your wife, or somebody else? Do you go for dinner uh, and you're not hungry and you still eat because your friends are like, oh, come on, you have to eat something and then you do, but you're not hungry and then you feel sick afterwards and then you have a horrible night of sleep because you succumb to pressure, to social pressure to try to be something that you're not. Are you eating like somebody else and not yourself? Are you sleeping? Are you living? Do you have relationships based on others' expectations of your behavior instead of your own truth. So if you're not living according to your truth, you're living a life of lies. And this is the worst thing that, I, that a human being can do. I don't care less if you never read any, a line about Ayurveda in your life, if you don't know your prakriti or your dosha, if you never come to India or do yoga, if you never meditate or anything else, it doesn't matter. As long as you are aware about your health, about your life, about your, your own life, in your, and you live your life in your own terms, you understand what is your truth, and you just spend every single day of your life doing that, living according to that. Not living according to some doctor, or according to a nutritionist, or according to your boss, or your parents' expectations. Live according to your own truth. That is the most important advice. If I had to burn 90% of this life that we did not right now, if like we lost all of it, and we could just save three minutes of it, I would save the last three minutes, this thing that we just spoke about right now. This is the most important thing that I will repeat for the rest of my entire life, I think. <laughs> Wonderful. Vadim Mateus, thank you so much uh, for your time, for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, just let us know if people want to find more about you, your project, where can they go, what can they make use of. Just let us know well, how to reach they, you. Yeah, they can find everything in probably vidaveda.org. If you put Vidaveda on Google, you'll find everything. We have a lot of content in Portuguese mostly, and we're coming up with more stuff in English soon. So if you put Vida Veda in any uh, social media platform, you will find us or we will find you. So don't worry about it. Okay, actually, I will leave some of uh, the links here and below in the description of this video. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Amazing. We should do this again Thank soon. I wish you a lot of luck with the channel. I know this is going to blow up because like, people need this a lot. I would like to thank everyone listening to us right now. If you're listening to this and you reach to this here, 
just click the like button underneath and share this with your friends because it means a lot. Subscribe to Ricardo's channel. This is a project that is was just born and you can be a part of it from the beginning. So welcome, Ricardo. Uh, welcome to this, to this project, to this channel. Thank you, Ricardo, for inviting me. And I hope to be a part of this as much as I can. Thank you so much. Thank you.